The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. If you empower the world, supporting any side that would fight your fellow human beings, you've already messed up and you've been seduced. And so long as you are in that seduced mode, you'll have grace and mercy, yes, but you cannot have that breakthrough you're looking for. A lot of people have to go out with an attitude. They have to go and take what they want. They have to hold on to everything they get. Not true. If the Lord is your supply and he supplies all of your needs according to his riches and glory, then in truth, what you really have to do is reestablish your entire life. You finally have to say you're supposed to be here. God did not make a mistake. That's a pretty big statement when you say I'm supposed to be here and God did not make a mistake. People, we have something called excuses. And if our lives are not what we want it to be, we don't like it. Time to get beyond that. Because I can, I can guarantee you what the Lord has for you is far beyond what you're able to imagine. Your end result is uh, not what you think it's supposed to be. It's far beyond that. God has not lost his capacity to blow your mind. And where you are right now is a testament to what the Lord is working with you on. Whatever situation you have right now, whatever's happening in your life is what the Lord is working with you on. If you can see it that way, life changes. Some of you may feel you're not blessed. That's incorrect. If you were not blessed, you would not be here this day. You wouldn't have this opportunity and you would not believe in Christ. You'd be done. You would go into a place absent all light, all hope, all everything. But don't worry. The Lord is going to give people wake-up calls and they're not going to be pretty. And if they were just war, that would be great, but they're not. If they were just small insights, that'd be great, but they're not. If it were just this strange UFO stuff, that'd be great, but it's not that way. The Lord's going to show you, demonstrate what darkness actually is. I do not believe for one moment anybody on earth has experienced what darkness truly is. I know. I think that's a well-hidden secret of Satan himself. That's what I think. It is not passive. It is all-consuming, and everything Satan does is through the act of seduction. In other words, there's nothing uglier you can imagine. There's nothing darker you can imagine than what Satan actually is. And that will be revealed in what it is. It'll become a very serious matter. Very serious. But for those of you who don't really need that, you won't have to go through that. A lot of people don't want to go through the end times. That depends on how stubborn you are. Are you obedient without having to see any of these things? If you are, there's no need for you to go through any of that. If you are obedient, all darkness, all the darkness you see will not disturb you. If darkness does disturb you, you resist it in certain areas. Hope you really get that. You're not to be vulnerable. Now of us are. The Lord does not raise up vulnerable children. The Lord does not raise up frightened children. He does not. When we resist, we slow our progress. If our progress is slowed, things still scare us. Why? Because we don't understand what they have a capability of doing. That's why. When you're no longer frightened, that's when you never have a problem in your life. You just simply see your father working. And you seek to learn all of what's learnable from the father, but which, by the way, is a huge blessing. Right? Your problems are huge blessings. If you can't see it that way, right? in all honesty, I'm saying this as humble as possible. You've been pushing against God's will, which means you don't want all of what God has for you. You're not willing to go through some of his processes that will raise you up. God is the only one that knows how to raise you. We don't know how to raise ourselves. You know how a small child, they say, I can do it. You try to do some form. I can do it. I can do this. I can do that. And they mess it up. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's exactly what we do. And then when it comes to darkness, when it comes to threat of war, when it comes to all sorts of things, we begin to reflect. Hey, I've been hurt before. I felt pain, this, that, and the other. I don't want to feel that again. I'm frightened to death because I don't want to go through that. Well, the reason you're still like that is because you're holding on to areas associated with that. Once you forgive an area in your life, pain, suffering, all that is disassociated. In fact, PTSD is when it's actually when a soldier cannot forgive themselves, when a person cannot forgive themselves, when they do take part of the blame for what happened and they have zero resolve in their minds. They have no resolve. Anybody who has PTSD, but they have a relationship with Christ. The cross was sufficient for anything you could have done in your ignorance. Now, let me explain this. Every time I was deployed and had to fight in combat, it was in ignorance. 
and I was a Christian, yes, but it was in ignorance. Here's why. If I would have known what I know now, I would have never had myself in a position to be deployed, number one, or I would have gone about things in a very different way. Ignorant means you don't know. If all of us knew the absolutes are the consequence of all sin, not one of us would ever sin again, no matter what it would cost us. We simply wouldn't do it. If we all understood intimately the process of Christ, not one of us would have an ability to choose darkness at any point in our lives. So because we don't know, because it's not real to us yet, all of it's not real to us yet, sometimes it's very easy to choose that sinful and quick path. If we knew what it absolutely entailed, we would not be able to choose sin at all. We wouldn't do it. We would rather die than to choose sin. And if we really, really knew, then uh, no fear would be with us at all. Now, I, I listen, I realize something. I realize that some of you guys are quite fearful of things. It's natural. There are some things I'm still fearful of. And I have to continue to face it until I'm not fearful of it. I have to see it. I tend to face everything that causes fear. Everything. Because if I don't, you hide from something that causes fear. You know what happens? You'll believe it's everywhere. And you can no longer go out. Then your days become very dark. How many of you feel stuck in your current position? And in fact, it feels like you are. You put yourself in this impenetrable place. And you really can't venture too far outside. Because it's unsafe to venture too far outside. And so you made for yourself this fortress. And you really have no desire to see what's on the opposite sides of those walls. Those same people who have done this. You also have cut yourself off from a great light. Do you know that? See, because the truth is, no one built anything around you. No one has power to do that. No one, not even Satan, no one can do that. We did that ourselves. No one has power to do that to us. We do that ourselves. And when we do that, you're in your mind. There's some things you want to do, right? There's a light you want to get close to, but because of the walls, you cannot. So, in essence, you feel stuck, cut off, isolated. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It feels like there's no way out. But here's the truth of all truths. That statement for you is impossible. Having no way out, that's impossible. Do you know why? Because no authority has power to shut you in. None. God will not do it. Christ will not command it. Devils cannot impose it. Do you know that? That's all up to us. But you have to know the mechanism. You have to know what components are involved. What have we done to build this fortress around ourselves to essentially trap ourselves into this place where we cannot move anymore? What can we do to get out of that? How do we tear this down? That's when you hear the Christ. Nobody has gotten away with anything. Do you know that? Not even us. Your Father in Heaven is not senile. Try to honor Him in that. By understanding that the Lord does not need us. He loves us. He didn't need you to keep a file cabinet on everybody who ever offended you. He knows exactly who they are and what their enemy is. He does. Have you guys ever seen certain stories where somebody gets shot in public and then the people protest and everything else and they say, we want justice, but they're supposed to be Christians? If I had a child that died at the hands of someone because they messed up or did something stupid, there's no way I would pick it and say that person needs to go to jail. If I had a loved one, that died at the hands of a very evil person. I would not have it in my heart that, oh, I need justice. Do you know why? Because I believe the truth. I believe that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That's what I believe. And everybody has a choice. I cannot make a choice for, my, for children. Children cannot make a choice for other children. You can't make a choice for your own children. Everybody has to choose unless they're below the age of accountability. When they're below the age of accountability, the Lord has them. And God help all who mess with them. He's got them. When they're above the age of accountability, they have to make their own choice. And if something were to happen to them, I know where they are. They transition. Because in truth, there is no death. There's but one death. And that death will come. Dying in the body, that's not death. That's a transition. Even for the evil people, it's a transition. Death is separation from everything. That is the goodness of our Father. Now that's true death. And death eternal. That's why it's called death eternal. See how that is? Death eternal. If somebody ever did that, I'm not going to get justice by somebody paying for what they did. That's called revenge. Now listen to me, saints. The Lord said, vengeance is mine. In fact, he said, don't touch it. 
I will repay, saith the Lord. But do you know how many people disregard that? And in the framework of the world, they operate against the Almighty. Why? Because the world says it's okay. Do you know that? Because some disgruntled person will say, aren't you going to look for justice? And it's almost like people are frightened to say, justice is my Father in heaven. That's what justice is, my Father in heaven. Somebody said, what age is the age of accountability? It's when a person truly understands and comprehends. They truly understand and comprehend, and they have conviction behind doing wrong things. So there's no set age. You can't say it's 15, you can't say it's 13, you can't say it's 10, you can't say it's 9. It's based upon the individual. It's when they truthfully and honestly understand, comprehend, and know what they're doing. Conviction is a good sign of the age of accountability. It's not based on an age. It's based on that spiritual growth, development, knowing the truth of an individual. And the truth of us has nothing to do with our flesh. Some of us are old by way of the Spirit. Some are young by way of the Spirit. Though, that person that's old by way of the Spirit may be nine years old right now. And the person young by way of the Spirit may be 80 years old right now. Yeah, that works. I'll say it again. The framework of the world has given men an opportunity to transgress all the laws of the living God. And people work within that framework, utilizing the world as an excuse to go against what they naturally know. You know what the Bible says about all of us? We naturally know God's ways. Somebody says, Mike, what about the souls underneath the altar? Well, let's go read it. We're going to go to Revelation. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So they were what? Slain for the word of God. And for what else? For the testimony that they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon them that dwell on the earth? Did you hear what they said? They said, Analyze. They said, How long, O Lord? They didn't say, How long, judge? They didn't say, How long, brother? That's not what they said. They said, How long, O Lord? What does that tell you right there? That they will not seek vengeance outside of the mandate of the Most High. Thank you, Lord. Do you see that? That's absolute recognition that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So they didn't direct it to anybody else but the living God. They said, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Did you hear that? How long are you going to put up with everybody, Lord? You are the avenger. When are you going to avenge us? So vengeance within their hearts is not there. They're asking the Lord, when is he going to do it? I love that. Do you see that? They're asking the Lord, when is he going to do it? Now, why would this even be in there? It's in there for us. Why? I'm going to show you guys something. They are under the altar, right? In your heart of hearts, in a portion of your soul, you say to yourselves most often, Lord, how long is this going to go on? You're saying the same thing they are saying. You may not be physically destroyed, you may not, for the word of God and for the testimony which you hold. But when you are suppressed, when you're doing righteousness, when some evil comes upon you and won't permit righteousness to be done, but in fact, they enact an evil thing in your very soul, you say the exact same thing. Lord, how long until you come back and make all this right? You're crying out to focus here then, is how they said this. They were asking the Lord, and they were discussing His judgment, His vengeance. They are to be avenged, but they cannot be satisfied by obtaining vengeance. They said, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge? Because he has not judged. Listen, dost thou not judge? Because he has not judged. And avenge, because he has not avenged our blood on them that dwell on the earth. If God were to judge right now, my goodness, just about everybody would drop there. Nobody is ever going to mistake the judgment of the living God. No one will ever say, I wonder if this is God's judgment. No one will ever say, I wonder if this is the Lord's vengeance. Is this the Lord's indignation? No one will ever say that. This is the book of Revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ. But this revealing, as you if you read this, you're going to find out this revealing is always for every generation. Revelation is applicable. For you, it is applicable. At the beginning of Revelation, there is a statement. And at the end of Revelation, there is a statement. Do you guys know what that is? 
Do you know what the Lord said about this? First, he said the time was at hand. Listen, it says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things which are therein, for the time is at hand. The time is happening. I will never look at Revelation like it's coming in the distant future, but I understand the components of Revelation are active right now for each one of us. God foreshadows every major prophecy. So it's almost like a microcosm of Revelation, the shadow of it that happens in your life. It is very relevant for your life right now. The same components in Revelation you have dealt with in your personal life, they do overlap. And if you comprehend and hear what the Lord was saying in Revelation, it becomes guidance in your life right now, not the future right now. There's a collective time when things happen. Think about the flood. That was pretty major. The flood. What happened before the flood? I'll tell you what happened. Before the flood, that before the deluge, there was a deluge of something else before that. Anybody know what that is? There was a deluge of unrighteousness. There was a deluge of murder. There was a deluge of the loss of all species. Do you not understand? The species were lost. Human beings were lost. They were changed, mutated, and everything else. Creation itself was lost. Do you not know that? This was before the flood. And then so what did God do? He destroyed creation through the flood, keeping those elements he decided to keep. No one escaped what he did. He had mercy on people, yes, but the Lord did exactly what he did his way, and he foreshadowed that by the deeds and the activities that were taking place in the earth. It was of no surprise to the Lord, but is showing us his own heart by these readings. Nothing surprised the living God. Sometimes we read the Bible like it shot God. It did not. The Lord had this written. This is inspiration of the word given to us by writing so that we can know who our father is, so that we can know how he felt how he saw things, how he loves us, how he expects what he created to be in righteousness and in light, not darkness and death. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we act like something surprised the living God. No, remember something. If I were to write down all the happenings of my life, I would write down those areas that will do somebody else good. So I will speak in a way, I'll name the exact things that happen, yes. But the way I speak those things, may be different. They're going to reflect my sentiment. You see that? They're going to reflect my sentiment. The Lord did the same way. He reflected his sentiment, his mind, his heart of a situation by way of these writings. He did. So when he said, don't do this, that, and the other, some people read that wrong. They read that through self. Remember we studied that? To read something through yourself is not hear the Lord say it, but it's our construct of what God is, and we shouldn't do that. God didn't yell. He didn't have to yell. God's anger is nothing like man's anger. Man's anger, it, just like your emotions, are different from the emotions of a, of a bug if you were to interpret emotions. In fact, you can't even relate a bug to a human being. You can't do that. No more than anybody can relate us to the living God. Most people personify, and I believe they make a big mistake in doing so. God is love, and love is not silly. Do you know that? Love is not silly. And anybody who's ever had love within them, they know how serious love is. They know that love is willing to go all the way to the end for the sake of the other person. They know that love does not think about itself because someone who does something out of love has no thought of their own life. They're full of sacrifice, full of giving. And they are extremely declarative in what they are both doing and what they set out to do. They are thorough. They never back down. And most importantly, their heart never reflects what they want out of anything. Their heart will always reflect the good they have for somebody else. That's what love is. We're just learning that. Man did not define love right. I know you guys like these love songs in the world, but you might as well go ahead and admit that's about lust, a, a, a deep blindness, and some more things. But it is not the love of God. In fact, love itself. If you truly love someone, you'll never cry for yourself. You can only cry for the one you're loving. Do you know that? And you won't cry in sorrow. You always cry tears to overcome. This earth stuff that, that men have made is called self-pity and sorrow. And they call that love. That's not love. Self-pity and sorrow is not love. That's not what that is. Love is full of sacrifice. Love takes no thought of itself. Love does not pity itself. Love is always on a mission. Love takes no breaks. And love need not receive anything. But love does have a requirement to pour out or it wouldn't be love. 
So the world teaches people that everything is energy, based on the world's framework of things. And as we were just discussing it, just a few things that are different from that framework, the world has set out a framework that all of us had no choice but to learn, to live by it, to work within it. But I want you to take a second look. The framework of the world serves the world. Do you guys know why it was invented? Why? You know, there's an explanation. Because people wrote down why they began banks in the first place. Do you know, I hope you know that. They wrote books, right? Books, lots of books. Books are records. They wrote records of the motivations behind the creations that they had. Why banks exist. Why money exists. Why even gold and silver would eventually be taken out of the system, but money would remain. They, they wrote down reasons for this. They wrote down why why they had a separation of church and state. They wrote down a whole bunch of things. We're talking about the, the founders, the ones who accepted and took certain parts of different countries in the great melting pot called the USA and began to build a nation, the big experiment. They built this so that the individual, a chosen individual, could make to him or herself an independent kingdom. This is supposed to be a place of independent kingdoms that they wanted to eventually rule the entire world and that everybody here in this place would have his or her own kingdom. When different races began to come, and the, from the beginning, they, exclude, they did exclude certain races. They did. But we know they, you know, they had no choice but to uh, uh, throw that one away. And then, of course, they set up moral standards. They set up government. They were seeing what worked and what would not. Bad things happened when they built this place. Lots of blood of the innocents are in the soils, and they do cry out to this very day. Nevertheless, they built an institution called America that the entire world depended on. Do you not know that America was the capital of the world? It was. Now it has rivals. Do you know that America and American Christianity began to go all over the world? You know what the, but there was an issue. While they did that, and some men were highly moral in doing that. They really believed that each person, each person should be able to exercise his or her rights of speech and everything else. And they had that. That's called government. That's how they set it up. But always remember this. They did that because of their own oppression from a monarchy, from having a king that ruled what you believed and how your life was governed. They got away from that. They got away from these kingship families. That would rule everything. How a person on the outskirts of the city had no voice, no education, no anything. And so what they did was they set up a place where everybody would have equal opportunity to become whatever they wanted to be. And that's how it began. But with anything, with any good intention in the earth, the one element they, they probably did not spend enough time on was the invasion of darkness. Lucifer will usurp everything in the kingdoms of this earth. And then they began to make deals with him. And that's why the Church of Satan, the capital of the Church of Satan, is right here in America. It's not somewhere else. Because they started making dark deals. That's why ultimately darkness is rising in America first. That's why they're, 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 they have to use propaganda. That's why they have to paint the picture for you. They don't want you to see the real picture. That's why they're holding on by their teeth to old ideologies. But now a new thing is about to come in. The real darkness. The absolute darkness, we know what that is, is coming in. Already things are beginning to open. Real things, not fake things. Not fake. You do realize also, let me tell you guys something. I'll say it one time, I'm not going to say it again. This year, 2023, is the declared year of the paranormal world in America, which will spread to the entirety of the earth. You do understand that, right? This is a declared and purposed year for paranormal things. I hope you know that. That's an unleashing is what it is. And that takes specific steps of the people in which the people are very complicit with it. You're the only thing in the way of that. Somebody said the veil is being lifted. Well, think of it this way. The veil is controlled by the living God. So no one has the ability to do anything with the veil. They don't. They really don't. Even the area that demons occupy, which bubbles around this earth. Men can look into that, but that's not the real veil. The real veil is uh, a massive consequence and only God has power to do anything with that. He will determine when that is open or closed. But for men to peer into the other place, men can do that. 
because God gave man dominion over this world. And that other place is bound with this world so that things are all around you, yet they don't get in your way. Remember that. So we're, there's this tiny bubble around this full of darkness, but God controls the real veil. If God were to open the real veil, nothing would have a chance. Also keep in mind, if God wanted to defeat all evil, he could do that with one word. He didn't have to launch an army or anything else. So why would God have an army anyway? Because he's raising. In the King James Version of the Bible, it communicates that even angels have their process. Did you know that? They're made eternal, but they have their process. Keep that in mind. So God has his reasons for doing things, which is why it's not good for us to begin to theorize about holy things and come up with the wrong thing and then we find ourselves having misguided masses of people over a theory i kind of recoil at those theories big time somebody says can you tell us to identify those non-human beings like those uh, synthetic ones we will know anyway good enough so, yeah you'll know that anyway here's the first question about identifying of human beings why would god say be careful to entertain strangers because you'll entertain angels unaware why would that be in the bible anybody know and believe me, they minimize that. But why would that be in the Bible? I'll give you an answer. It means your discernment does not work for those areas God has kept unto himself. It is impossible for any area God has kept unto himself for anybody to peer into and know the difference. It's also because our Father works in truth. If you knew every element in the world, you would adjust your life to serve accordingly. But because we operate by faith, that means we don't know the truth of everything God he wants us and he has us in a position to operate based off the truth of us no one forces us to darkness or light god simply introduces darkness or light based on who we truly are we do choose if a person in the end has chosen darkness they were dark in the first place they were never part of the family if a person chooses light 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 despite all they're going through with that person is truly of the light every day you're given an answer in everything you do to the question, will you choose darkness or light? Keep in mind that Satan fell. So we're in this process of faith, which means you don't see anything, you simply choose. This, what you naturally are internally, is going to gravitate towards all your choices. And in the end, you will have become darkness or light based on what you have actually been choosing. And what you choose is not actually every deed that you do. What you choose is the truth of you. Remember that. Now, many of us in our ignorance have chosen darkness. Why? Because we were scared to death. And that was the only choice we really had. Sometimes choosing righteousness when you're first starting is a no-go because you'll say, I can't survive that way. So what is that called? Ignorance. That means we did not know all the mechanisms regarding choice in this world. Many of us see a Christian, somebody who truly belongs to the living God. The only reason they were deeply involved in darkness in the first place was they were trying to survive. Do you guys understand me? The righteous, when they're young, before they're built up spiritually in strength, they choose dark paths many times. They lie. They do things. They do this to survive. Many do that to hide from the world. They do that. See, if you belong to the world, you need not build up this false character to present to the world and try to hide behind it. When you belong to the world, the world will embrace you, but it did not embrace you, did it? And so what you ended up doing was what? You tried to survive. You were trying to survive. And when it came to righteousness, the cost was so great, you thought this will surely do me in something else. You did not want to choose that sinful path. How many of you did not want to choose that sinful path? That means you have no, ple you have no pleasure in unrighteousness. Not for the majority of things. Now, some of us are sonish children. That means silly children. And of course, you you know you have a little folly here and there. But we're talking about if 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 before you got serious with the Lord, if you could go back and undo things in darkness that you did, you would undo them even before knowing the Lord. I know in my life, I did not. I did not. I took no joy in doing certain things I did. Zero joy. That's why I'll never brag on who I am, what I've accomplished, and all this stuff. I'll never brag on that. For what reason? Would I ever do that? I'll never use it as a resume, qualifications, or anything else. Because most of us are not proud of who we used to be. I certainly am not. I'm blessed for what the Lord has offered me. Somebody said, Paul said, I'll brag in Jesus. Well, you got to read that context. He was giving us a point. That's what he was doing. And, and if you just pull that little piece out, you're going to miss the rest of it. 
and you'll find out the rest of it demonstrates he was not talking about the subject we're talking about at all. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about something else. He was giving us a comparison in the scriptures. And if you read the total context of it, he was talking about the power of the living God, how disgusting of an individual he was, how when he thought he was doing right, he destroyed much, so that only by the salvation of Christ he could operate, and in that he could boast on. That's what he was talking about. Because Christ saved him from himself, that he can boast on. And essentially, he can boast on this, that Jesus is the Savior. That's what he can brag most on. Never the promotion of ego. Never the promotion of self-accomplishment. Never the promotion of that. And when you read that in context, you can extract those things. The Word of God is very consistent in its values. There's little to no ambiguity, really. We are the ones who are ambiguous or puzzling, confusing, full of mixed up stuff. We are. Everything you go through is purposed. You know what that means? That means you're right where you're supposed to be. Wherever you are, that's where you're supposed to be. Do you guys know that? Whatever you're doing in life, wherever you are, if you were not supposed to be there, the Lord would not have you there, would he? Now, He's God's not here to control our lives. He's not. And we have a helper for that, the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to read something in John pertaining to the Holy Spirit. That helper with the Holy Spirit is, is, is quite extraordinary. Now, take note of something. In the Gospel of John, Jesus kept emphasizing how he did not judge anybody. He's kept doing that. He did. And he kept emphasizing that the Father has all command of, of, of judgment. Keep that in mind. Because if judgment is in your heart, something is, uh, something is wrong that you potentially can't get over. I want everybody to turn to the Gospel of John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Why would he say that? Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. Take note of something. Jesus comes up at a time where people were under the rule of the Pharisees. They believed in the Ten Commandments. To have the fulfillment of a Messiah was shocking. If Jesus were to pop up right now, how many people would believe it's Christ? He probably wouldn't. They would pick every every area they could pick to disqualify, which is how people do. People are predominantly concerned about disqualifying somebody rather than qualifying somebody because they don't want to be tricked. How do you become absolutely 100% sure? Anybody? The world teaches and logic teaches that there are a few requirements a person has to make, right? So you have to watch for those requirements. You have to really have a person qualified based on requirements. It's what the world teaches. It's what logic teaches. It's what people know what to do. So if Christ would come back now, they would look for a few things, correct? How could a person know beyond all of that? How could you know? Because when he came back then, there were certain things they were looking for in prophecy that he was to fulfill when he came back. So I can't even call them absolutely guilty of those who didn't quite embrace him at the time. I can't call them guilty because they were looking for requirements. What's the one thing? The one thing, This we have to do this from the onset. While everybody was looking and trying to, because they said Jesus would never take. And the Ten Commandments says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, correct? So they're thinking in their minds, who would take the grain, the holy grain, and distribute that among people? Who in the world would do that? If they're in fact from the living God, why why would they do that? If that was the Messiah, wouldn't his rule be first and foremost in the earth? So what was with the uh, you know the tearing down of things like that? Why would he do that? So that that's uh, you know it's kind of a, a contradiction. I'd be like somebody coming today saying that they're Christ, and then they would do something that we would deem unholy. Well, who would accept that person? Who would accept that person? Most of us would not accept that person. It's my entire point. Most of us would not accept that person, right? Most people now, they want, because they're asking, well, how, how would you guys know if the two witnesses are here? A lot of people say, well, it would have to be, you know, Elijah and somebody else. But how would you know what Elijah looks like? How could a person qualify themselves as being Elijah? How could somebody do that? How could somebody qualify themselves as being any of the prophets? You just can't look at them and say, oop, yep, that's Elijah. See that beard? You know, That's not what you're going to do. So how would you know? So what I'm telling you is this, if anybody came back, if anybody came into this world claiming to be someone, the world is not going to believe it. Somebody's going to stand up and say, no, they're not supposed to come back yet. It can't be fulfilled because this has to happen. In fact, the Pharisees were saying the same thing. That can't be the Christ because things have to happen before the Christ comes. And if you read all through scripture, it foretells about Christ coming to die. 
and then Christ coming again for all of his children. But they weren't discussing about Christ dying. They totally skipped over that one. In other words, anybody who would have come, they wouldn't have have accepted unless that person fulfilled the theory they had floating in the minds. Did you hear that? So they were looking for a specific person that based on their theory, he would fulfill everything according to their theory. People are going to, they're, they're, they're going to do the same thing today. They're not going to accept the truth that will be right in front of them. Be- why? Because they have a preconceived notion, because they have a theory. And they're going to say, well, if it doesn't work out like my theory, it can't be the one. See how foolish that is? Even the timing of Christ didn't come out right. But he was right here standing for, before people. And they could not receive him because it was outside of their timing. In other words, they believed their own theories more than the word of God. And they were blind as bats. Why? Because they, they believed in their own theory. If you believe in your own theory, you're done for. Because you will not be utilizing the mechanism the Lord has set in place just for us. And it's important that you begin to utilize that. How many people have read something in the Bible you thought you were right? You told other people about it. You thought that theory was right. And five years later, it changed. But you never went back to go tell those people it changed. How many people have done that? How many people have come back and said, you know what? I was wrong, 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 wrong. That's not the way it was. How many pastors have come back and said, well, fellas, I was wrong, 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 wrong. That's not the way it was. You don't hear that too much, right? Because everybody's predominantly concerned about them being a valid person, a valid pastor, a person who does not make mistakes, this, that, the other, blah, 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 blah. Everybody's concerned about their own reputation. Because if they don't have a good reputation in the world, the world's not going to favor them. Which is why most people say, Mike, you're just never going to make it doing what you're doing. Well, I'm not trying to make it do what I'm doing. I'm not doing this to make it. Isn't that funny? Why are you going to make it? Well, it's up to the Father, not me. He'll determine, he'll supply. He'll make ways. He'll shut doors and open doors. He'll do everything. But a lot of people can't understand that. Why? Because they're operating by what? A theory, a preconceived notion. Now, let me ask you guys something. Do you have a preconceived notion about Christ? Do you have a picture in your head of who Christ is? Uh Uh-oh. Did I hit a soft spot? I'll be honest with you guys. I have zero preconceived notion of who Christ is. None. I have no image in my head of who I think Christ is. None. I do not liken Christ to any race in the world or anybody anywhere at all. I don't do that because there's no need for me to have a preconceived notion. Do you know why? I've learned something over time. When you're waiting revelation from the most high, God will have revealed to you exactly who somebody is. There are people I've met that I've never seen before. By way of the living God, I was able to recognize them. I had no picture in my head of who they were. None. The Lord was simply let me know. You're going to know who it is when I show them to you. Okay. So then my mind's not jumbled up for who a person is. And I'm looking for no one in particular. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, a person who nobody would ever pay attention to would do the exact thing that the Lord has given me recognition of. And voila, there it is. And it's never been wrong. So in other words, I rely upon the Lord to know who I'm speaking to. Just like you guys. I would never speak to you having read anything about your life and then say, oh, I know this person based on what I read. I don't do that. No need to do that. If I'm speaking to you and if I need to know something about you so that I can help you because I'll never use anything the Lord gives me to accuse, the Lord will give that to me while I'm talking to you. In other words, he will have revealed to me everything I need when it's needed, not before. I don't need something long before to have confidence. I've learned never to do that. The Lord supplies as needs arise. He does not give us long-term things so that we can sit in our comfort knowing we have something taken care of in years ahead. He didn't do that. As a need arises, he operates. When you learn to live like that, that's when your confidence is boosted. Big time. Big time is when your confidence is boosted. So listen to me. You live this life in this world. You live according to the world in a lot of ways fine you do that that's fine right but remember this the lord will supply you when things are needed and he'll never fail to do that remember that about your lord you can go gather up your stuff all you want on your own but the, what you absolutely require the lord will grant to you when it's needed he will do the unbelievable he's not going to do the same thing your neighbor can do he's not going to do the same thing another human being can do He's going to do what nobody's able to do. And he's going to do that for your faith. He's going to do that for your resolve. 
He's going to do that for your growth. He always has a reason behind what he does. He's not going to do something normal like everybody else so that we, you know, won't even think about him when that thing is supplied. No, he's going to supply as we need and he'll do it in a, in a way that you never thought possible. So never ever say the Lord must come through door A or door B or door C or door E. Don't do that. But understand that the Lord will come from the ceiling. He'll come from a way that a door does not exist in. He'll always do above and beyond what you're able to ask or think. Remember that. That is incredibly real. When he does that a couple times in your life and you recognize it, guess what? You have confidence in the Lord and that's when you stop worrying. Because somehow, some way, we're going to get rid. With the Lord's guidance, this worry thing that people have in them will be absolutely expelled. No placement for it in you anymore. Worry is awful to have. Trust me, I used to have it a lot. Worry is awful to have. It is debilitating. It's almost as bad as fear. I believe worry is fear's brother. That's what I believe. And if God didn't give us a spirit of fear, then the brother of fear, which is called worry, is just as bad. And we don't need it. In order not to have worry, you have to have confidence in something higher, much higher than your situation. So if you have confidence in the most high, it's impossible to worry. It is. It's impossible to worry. Take note of that. So let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He said this. Why? Who is Jesus? Can anybody tell me who is Jesus? When he was sent down here to earth, who was he? Who is he? What is the Savior? Here it is. He is God's word made flesh. That's who he is. He is God's word made flesh. So who did God, who did God have hanging on the cross? His word, Lord have mercy. He put, he had men kill his word and his word, the first, his word became a sacrifice to us. But what did he do? He raised up a new word. Thank you, Lord. He raised up a brand new word, didn't he? Yes, he did. He raised up a brand new word. Most people cannot see beyond the physicality of what happened. But God had the same word that condemned us to eternal separation. He had that word sacrificed and he raised up a new word. And now in that new word, we have what? Salvation. We have redemption. We can absolutely, totally be redeemed in that new word. Jesus is the word of God. He was one sent like unto the only begotten. He is the first of many brethren. And you are joint heirs with what? With the word of God. You're joint heirs with the word of God. Nothing ever happened absent what? The word. God spoke first, which was the word and things were. You're joint heirs with that. Do you understand? You, you may not be getting that. So that means everything that comes out of your mouth is not like everybody else's. In your mouth should be found the righteousness of Christ, not the guile of this world. You are joint heirs with Christ. If you're joint heirs with Christ, then you are what? You're also an authoritative word. You are an authoritative word. You are an absolute word. Do you understand that? So when you speak gibberish, when you conform to the standards of this world and speak the draconian tongue, what are you doing? You're giving your power over to them. That's why things happen in the world, because of you. That's what Satan is doing. He'll have you speak words of his kingdom. And so his kingdom has grown. Do you see that? John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Because why? You are the word you speak. And the word you speak is you. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. God's word is not a lie. God's word is not fabrication. God's word is not wishful thinking. God's word is an authority. And whatever comes out of God's mouth is. In his house is there are many mansions. Now this word mansion does not imply a big house on a hill. But I'll have to preserve that. Because if you were to find out what it is, all of you would log out, go log back in, and go do start some searching on the internet. Because it's pretty heavy. So we'll save that one. But just remember, Jesus said in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
what kind of place? A mansion. He just told us in his house are many mansions. He just told us he went to go prepare a place for us. He's preparing a place just for us. He says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That means you have placement. Listen, he said, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Did you hear that? He said, if I leave, I go leave and prepare a place for you. I'm doing this because I'm about to come back and get you and take you to that place I prepared for you. Now, keep in mind, God said this. The word spoke this years ago, thousands of years ago, correct? What does that mean? This wasn't just spoken today. It does not take Christ nor the Father all the time that we deem as time to go and prepare things like that. That means he's not going to fail in this. He has not failed in this. And the time now draws to a close. Listen, he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Primarily, let your minds be on that one thing, that the Lord will come back and to receive you. Hit The purpose of him coming back is to receive you first. That's why it was said of Christ, he will present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He left to go prepare a place for you, to come and receive you. He's coming to get you, to take you to the places he prepared for you. That means what? You might want to get ready to be received. Your primary task is to be ready to be received. All the virgins have awakened with one message. And what is that message? He is coming. Everybody has already awakened. Don't let your flame go out now. That's when you reach deep down. You say, wait a minute. Instead of me feeling all depressed, instead of me feeling locked in, hopeless, like nothing is ever going to change, let me remember that the Lord has preserved me up until this day and that he's coming back again to receive me. Let me get some things prepared because he's coming back. See, even in the weddings overseas, nobody knows, nobody knows when that uh, groom is going to be sent except the father and the father sends him. Everybody has to maintain a state of readiness because they don't know when he's coming. Even in a Jewish wedding, they don't know when he's coming. And so they have to stay ready. They have certain preparations that they do to keep themselves in the festive heart, right? Because they don't know when he's coming. And so everything has to be prepared. If things are not prepared, if they're not prepared, if a person is not prepared, because no one knows when it's coming. If that person is not prepared, they're unfit for that wedding. Don't let that be you. Because when he comes back, it's all said and done. When he comes back, he's looking for those presentable figures to go with him. The five wise virgins who had their flames going. How does your flame go out? Your flame goes out when you start blaming stuff. Your flame is well lit when you harness things. The oil, in this case, is either there or you're going to have to go back and buy some, purchase some, pay the price for some. Those of us who have paid a price in this world, those of us who have some, those of us who have great loss, we have a lot of oil burning and nothing is going to put out the flame of faith. Do you hear me? Nothing can make my flame go out. What is Satan going to do? Is it, Mike, you're going to lose everything? Okay, like that didn't happen before. What is he going to do? Nothing can put out that flame. Nothing can stop. Somebody can say, well, Mike, you're not going to receive any blessings from the Most High. So be it. That has nothing to do with my servitude of the Most High. It's not based on what I've received from him now. It's based on what I can contribute to him for what he already did. You see how my flame is not going to dwindle out? Satan can't speak anything to me to cause my flame to go out. Why? Because of the oil. And what is that oil? All this stuff I've been through, and yet I'm still here. All this stuff I've been through, my condition should be far worse than what it is right now. But the Lord has mercy and grace is sufficient, right? I can see that. So who's going to put the flame out? And for what reason? They can't, because I know the truth. Somebody can say, Mike, you're going to lose everybody in your life. No, that's impossible. Can't do that. That's a big lie. Most of what Satan speaks is a lie. Nothing's going to put that flame out. Why does it cost so much? You got to go into the world and pay your dues to get it. You have to go through something to have your faith fortified. You have to endure something to have your faith fortified. You have to live through your process to get that oil. He said, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, in the way you know. Where I'm going, you know, in the way 
to get there, you know. And, and Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. And how can we know the way? This is going to get interesting. So Jesus says, you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. And Thomas says, I don't know where you're going. And we don't know how to get there. We don't know the way there. Jesus said unto him, this is uh, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus said, I'm going to the Father. You know that, and you know the way. Thomas says, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he answered the question. Jesus was going unto the Father. So we answer that one. In the way was Christ. Now, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, how can that be a path? Uh-oh, here we go. This becomes very important. Listen, your interpretation of Christ and Christ, they are two different things. How you think you see Christ is one thing. How Christ is, is another. Understand that. Most people see Christ in their own personal way. But as the apostle said, that way is no good. See, that's why the apostle said, we knew Christ in the flesh, but now we know him no more after the flesh. You see that? So they knew him by his deeds. They knew him by all these ways, by way of the flesh. They don't know him anymore that way, which means what? It was further clarified. In other words, they see him as he has presented himself, not through the filter of flesh. They're not making Jesus into being this thing they can see in their mind's eye. No, Jesus is the word he spoke. And the word he spoke is Jesus. That word he spoke is truth, which grants eternal life. We can see Christ through our own eyes and say, well, you know, uh, I think Jesus wouldn't mind if I did this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't see speaking for Christ. That's when you see the image of Christ in your own mind. That's exactly what people are doing. In so doing, they have created to themselves a false Christ because Christ is not what we see in our head. Christ, his identity, is already established by the living God, not by us. The identity of Christ is not established by us, by our interpretation. It is established by the Most High, and it has been established by the Most High, and it is the Word of God. And we continue. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you cannot go unto the Father through another human being. Nope. You go to the Father by Christ. All things are presented by the Son. Nothing goes directly to the living God except through His Word. It cannot go through any woman or any man but through Christ. I have respect for all the apostles, but it is Christ who presents me. It is Jesus of Nazareth who presents me. When He died, He died for everybody. That's why in the Word of God it says, now you can go boldly to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. Boldly to the throne of grace. That throne of grace was described. That is an audience with the Father via Christ. That's why we call no one Father except our Father in heaven. That's why. Let me continue. He says, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Jesus conveyed something in John 14, 7, that everything he did, everything he spoke, it was the Father. To see the activities in the heart, in the ways of our Father, was to simply see Christ in action. Why? Because Christ is the Word of God. Just like you are the Word you speak, and the Word you speak is you. If, if you write a letter to someone, they don't meet you. They read your letter, and by way of those words, they interpret you. Do you see that? When you are speaking face to face with someone, they don't know you by what you look like. They know you by what you say, which is why when you open your mouth, the looks can change. Because if you were beautiful, nice looking, whatever the case was, but all that came out of your mouth was guile, you would become ugly real quick. It doesn't matter how you look. It matters what you say. It matters what you communicate. It matters that word that comes out of your mouth. That's how people know you for you. Not by your looks. Not by what you're wearing. By your word. Do you see that? So then to see someone with the eye is superficial. We know each other by the word we speak. That's how we know. We continue. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it sufficeth us. In other words, that'll make us. That'll be sufficient for us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long a time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 
And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, the Father in me, and that the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. My goodness, there it is. So Jesus did not act in his own regard, even in the flesh. Whatever he did was the Father's doing. Whatever he spoke was the Father speaking. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh, so he is essentially the living Word, walking among men. And listen, you know what that means? That means all who did not believe him did not believe the words of the living God, so how can they be his? If you don't believe what God speaks, how can you be his? That's why Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. Why? Because the sheep or those who were created from the living God are going to understand the Father's words. They're going to hear the Father's words because he is their father. And a stranger that speaks something else, they're not going to follow. When I hear somebody talk about, you know, lots of people talk about the Lord, but sometimes I cringe at certain things I hear, especially when it empowers man over the living God or man thinks he is standing in the stead of God in the world. And then they ignore Christ, which is the word. How can you not know? If you can't hear God's words, you don't know God. You have to hear the words he speaks or you don't know him. If a person discounts the New Testament, what God are they speaking about? Don't you find that odd? If somebody saw my birth certificate, but they ignored everything I ever wrote, how are they going to know me? Let me continue. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall I do, because I go unto the Father. That one I love. See, that one mystifies people, and it shouldn't. Why would it mystify anybody? I'll tell you why. That's a statement of faith. See, if you really believe, you have no skepticism about that. Because you begin to realize some things. Jesus did miracles, didn't he? So have many of you, and you missed it. Jesus healed many. So have many of you. There are people in your life that could not take another step until the Lord got you involved. I still meet people, and it is, it's very difficult for me to believe. I still meet people I had a big impact on. For example, one person came to me and he said, you know, if it had not been for you, I would not be who I am today. At the time when I was about to fall, you encouraged me this, that, and the other. This was as a soldier, from soldier to soldier. And they said it was by your encouragement, your leadership. I am where I am today. That is so difficult to comprehend, especially when you do not see yourself as anybody of any importance. And yet somebody would recognize your effort into their lives as guidance, as actually doing something that indeed is a miracle. You guys have people like that in your lives. You never know who's been barely holding on. And you could have said to that person, hey, you hang in there. And that would have meant the world to them. And they did it. You saved a life. There have been people who are about to die, about to give it up. But they met you. And because of your words, they decided not to. So essentially, they were dead. But by your time, they lived. And you see that? That's what you're doing. And there are no limitations in your life. No limitations on who you can reach. The dark one, the evil one, would have you believe that you're doing nothing. But on occasion, the Lord can demonstrate to you. Sometimes he'll have a person come back to you to let you know what's truly been done. And it's just beginning. He says, I'm going to read this again verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall I do, because I go unto the Father. He said, because I go unto the Father, greater works will you do. Let's qualify this. And whatsoever he shall ask in my name, that will I do. But who's going to do it? Who's doing it? Wait a minute. We're going to set this one straight. John 14, 13. He said, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Jesus is speaking here. And he's just told you, whatever you ask in his name, he will do it. Let me continue. He said, he said and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Who's going to do it? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ is going to do it. Who is what? The Word of God made flesh and dwelt among men, sacrificed on a cross, raised from the dead. Who is that? The Word of God. Whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, we're given a name. The only name we're given is the name of Christ. And I'm telling you now, you know what's in that name? When you say that name, what comes to your mind? The Word of God made flesh that was sacrificed for the sake of our sins. That's where the power is, not the pronunciation. It's the identification 
within you. You can speak the name Jesus in many different languages. You may not even notice the name Jesus in certain languages, but it's what you relate that word to that makes it powerful. There was a time I had a dream and these things were coming up from the ground. And it was one of those weird dreams that you can't even tell it was a dream. And I was scared to death. I mean, I was scared to death. These things were coming to get me. And I began to rebuke them in the name of Jesus. The only thing I knew to do. And they start laughing. And they were still coming. And the number increased. I said, oh my goodness. And then everything stopped and everything went quiet. And I was given instructions. Because at first I was saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And nothing was happening. Not one thing was happening. That they increased and more were coming. But then instruction was given to me, something I gave to COT back in 2010, 11, and 12. I was told what to say and why. What I was told was this, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the only begotten Son of the living God, who died and was raised from the dead in his name. And when I said that, when that was given to me and I actually said that, you know what happened? Forget about the pronunciation of the name. At first, I was just saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. But when that was given to me to say it, I began to see Jesus on the cross. And when I saw Christ on the cross, everything fled. I couldn't even finish what I was saying and everything fled. From that moment on, I don't say a word in dream. Not one word. But I'll see my Lord on the cross, knowing what he did, and I start to bow. It's almost a mental bow. I start to bow. I start to kneel. And everything flees to the point I don't even have those dreams anymore. Nor in reality. Why? Because I found that the Lord showed me a word is just a word for us. Unless you have an association. And when I was speaking the name of Jesus, I had no association with the word. And so by saying the only begotten son of the living God who died on the cross, right? And was raised from the dead. I began to associate the word with who Jesus is. And there came the rebuke and the power. Nothing can touch that act Jesus did on the cross. And I'm telling you, that's where the power is. Not us floating around mentioning that word, because you can speak Jesus in many different tongues. And unless you have an association with the word, that word is powerless, because it's not going to mean anything. It's just vibrations leaving your mouth. Associate it. Something else happened to you. When I saw Christ on the cross, when I envisioned what I was talking about, fear fled. It left instant, just like that. You know how you're terrified in a dream? Fear fled before, listen, fear fled before everything was complete. I didn't even care what was coming at that point. I was only concerned about bowing before the Lord Jesus, for that act was everything. I could care less what was coming. I could care less if Satan himself was coming, because fear fled. And when fear fled, the only thing that existed, the only thing that mattered, was what the Lord had already established. Nothing else mattered. When I said that to a few people, they had breakthroughs because they began to do it. Everything changed. Listen, everything for them changed, not based on my instruction, not based on that, but based on the truth the Lord gave to me. If you speak a word with no association, it is only gibberish and vibrations. You assign meaning to everything you speak. You can speak in multiple languages. It's not guaranteed somebody understands the language you speak. So then words are just sounds unless you have an association. That word Jesus is only a word unless you associate it with the real deal. Because in different languages, that word Jesus is something totally different. But I found out I need not even speak. My soul speaks louder than my mouth could ever speak. By the way, in a dream, you're not really talking. I hope you know that. You're not talking in a dream. Nobody else can hear you. Nobody. You're not saying a thing. So when you rebuke something in a dream, how is it actually working? Because you haven't said anything. How is it working? Remember, you're joint heirs with the word. So you better believe the Lord's going to have an emphasis in your entire life regarding your words. That's why when everybody else spoke about things, nothing happened. But when you spoke, people jumped on you like fleas on a dog, didn't they? When you spoke something, you were chastised for what you look at your life. Throughout your life, the Lord allowed your speech to be judged more hard than everybody else around you to the point where you said, well, how can they say it and get away with it? I can't. Even in your normal life, the same thing happened. Did you not? Did people hear what you say, didn't they? And they jump on you for that, but let everybody else go. Why? Because God is showing you something that the words you speak matter. 
You're not just some average person out there. That's not what you are. You're joint heirs with Christ or joint heirs with the word of God. The words that come out of your mouth, you're meant to speak words of righteousness. You know what happens when you speak words of righteousness? God watches over his word to perform it, not ours. So, But you're meant to be joint heirs with Christ. So if you speak words of holiness, God watches over his word to perform it. God has already established the word. You can be a vessel that speaks his words and God watches over his word to perform it. See, all this theory stuff in the day that we live in is taking people further and further away from the words of the living God. They start speaking theories. God's not going to go out and, and watch over any theory that we speak. God watches over his word to perform it. But when you start speaking what thus saith the Lord, what he spoke, God will perform the word you just released. Do you understand that? As we continue in this reading, right? They couldn't recognize Christ and he was emphasizing to them. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. I do nothing of myself. I do everything. Whatever the Lord has spoken, I speak. It is God that doeth works. And he's just told you that greater works will you do because he goes unto the Father. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall I do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So the Father is glorified in the Son as you operate in righteousness in the earth. Uh oh, but this is a big, ginormous key. Have you ever wondered why God didn't come down and do something himself? Lord, why won't you end this? And why won't you stop this? And why won't you stop this? What did he just say? He just said it. The works that I do, you're going to do too. And greater works than these, because I go unto the Father. Here it is. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. He said he goes to be with the Father. But listen, anything you ask in his name, he will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The Father's glorified in the Son based upon what? How's it working? Through you. You're on earth. You are that point of contact of the power of the kingdom of God in the earth. You, the ordinary you, you're right here. And what does the Lord say? He went to go be with the Father. God can do it himself, but he's not going to do it himself. He's going to do it through you. You're on this earth learning some valuable things. Why do you think these lessons? in life are so critical to us that God would have us repeat them over and over again until we get them right. Why? Because what he's working is being worked through you. Christ is being glorified through the works that come through you in the earth. So when you're praying to the living God to do something, you keep forgetting. You keep forgetting. You keep forgetting. Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask in his name, that will he do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he emphasizes, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. You are right here on earth. The change needs to be made right here on this earth. You are setting the families and the people you're setting the middle of for a reason. You've been looking at them like you've been put in the wrong place. No, you haven't. You've been looking at the world like it's so rotten. And why can't God come back and undo all this evil? Because you're here. You have that recognition. You're stuck in the middle of those people. You have a capacity to become an instrument of the most high. To be used as a vessel that will glorify the sun. Do you not understand what's happening here? No wonder God has not come down and changed this or that. Because you are here. So what happens when you build a fortress and lock yourself in it? I'll tell you what happens. The world becomes just like it is. What happens when you're convinced that you're powerless? I'll tell you what happens. The world becomes just like it is. Even the end times, the end times could not form with the strength of the word in the earth. It couldn't. We've been undergoing another process that's been prophesied. But there's a process at the end that you're part of because you're the ones here at this time. And nothing has changed. You are still joint heirs with Christ. You're vessels that can carry the word of the living God and release them in this earth. Everything you say matters. Every conversation you have matters. Everything you think matters. Why do you think Satan tries so hard 
to get you to agree with the world. Everything Satan does is to promote the ideologies of the world so that you believe in them and begin to speak a word in the world for his kingdom. As a consequence, his kingdom has grown because you're the one with authority. Oop, time to change that. You guys understand? How do you speak something in the name of Jesus? What does that mean to speak something? Whatever you ask in his name, what does that mean? Listen, Jesus is the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. To ask something in the name of Jesus is to ask something founded in the word of God. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. To ask something in his name is to ask something of the word. Now, what way of God do you know of that can be beneficial right there where you are? Not your way, not your ideas. What way of the living God, what word of the living God could that place benefit from? where you are. See how that makes the word primarily important? And that's exactly what Satan is attacking. You see why he's attacking uh, Christ? He wants Christ totally removed out of people's minds. Why? Because if Christ is not involved in a person's life, how can they exercise authority and righteousness? They cannot. They cannot. The whole reason is that the Son may be glorified, in the, that the Father may be glorified through the Son. How's that happen? my way of you. The Father is glorified in the Son by you. But if you no longer speak those words of Christ as a representative of the kingdom, as a joint heir with Christ, to release those words of holiness in the world, what happens? Satan's kingdom has no resistance and it spreads. We have had hint after hint of something spreading. Do you see, do you see what COVID-19 did? Do you guys see what COVID-19 did? It was a disease, right? Whether contrived or not, it was a disease that began to spread. We're not worried about vaccines or anything else. But do you see what it took, what they thought it would take to stop it? And do you see how it consistently spread and sent? I mean, it was just chaos. That is Satan's kingdom. Why do you think COVID-19 came? That was for us. Can you see it now? Do you see what happened with COVID-19? It caused chaos around the earth. It shut down everything normal, didn't it? That's Satan's kingdom. It abruptly inhibited your way of life. People were dying, people were scared, confused, and everything else. The same thing would happen with the growth of Satan's kingdom. And they, and they tried to stop it. They were saying, well, we need to give everybody a vaccine because they needed a magic fix to stop it. The point here is that when a plague spreads like that, it does the same thing as Satan's kingdom in the earth when you're not here, when you're gone. If you were gone, there's no resistance to darkness. No wonder. Everybody has a mind on leaving earth and many have forgotten the fight that they represent. You're the only thing in the path in the way of evil itself, in dar of darkness itself. You are the, those designated vessels that can release the words of righteousness in the earth and in your homes and everywhere you are. Start with your homes. The kingdom of God is born within you. Establish it right there where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who's around you. How do you establish that? You have to take inventory of your own life. Begin to commit your works unto the Father. And you know what happens when you do that? He sends you thoughts of clarity by way of the Holy Spirit. Things that you would never think of. Then you're going to find yourself in the will of God. And guess what's found on the path of the will of God? I'll answer that. Everything you could possibly need. All of your provisions are not outside the will of God. Why? Because if you were ever to stay outside the will of God, you would surely die. It's not your place to walk. It's not your environment. So then everything you need in life is put on that path in the will of God. If you start walking that path of the will of God, you'll find all of your provisions. Everything you were missing is right there. It is not going to be on another path. The Lord did that on purpose. And you would find that path and eventually learn that every, every provision of yours is on that path of the will of God for your life. The Lord's work is a serious work, and the Father's way is a serious way. We're the ones who have been trying to forge a new path, trying to use some sort of strategy to navigate through life, forgetting that we are the authority in the earth. You are the joint heirs of Christ, or joint heirs of the Word of God in the earth. You're the vessels designated to release the words of God, that God would watch over His words to perform it. So that means where God's Word is absent. There's no performance there. God will not perform his word in that area. So long as we continue to release theories, a theory is not God's word. When we release God's word, he'll watch over his word to perform it. 
Some of you are seeing this, aren't you? And if you see it further, you'll start thinking like me. You see, I see Jimmy Crack Corn, everything outside of God's Word. I'm not concerned. Listen, I've lived through dangers that other people did not live through. Do you know why? Because my mind was on the Father in those areas. I've survived things nobody else came back from. Not because I'm special. It's because I decided to not operate by the spirit of fear. I decided no longer to utilize or to just give my authority over of being a vessel of a word over to the world. But I chose the Lord in things I do. I choose his path. In fact, I agree with this gospel. Do you guys agree with this gospel? Do you agree that all should be forgiven? Do you agree with that? Or are you one of those who are looking for someone to be punished? Because you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one, cling to the other, embrace one, and despise the other. You can't serve two masters. It's time for you to remember to really know who you are. Now, the Gospel of John, these, these small verses indicate quite a few, some major things. And indeed, it is a foundation. So let me ask you this. Even in your homes, I want you guys to reflect. Who have you been giving your authority to in your homes? It does no good to stand up and stomp and declare your rebuke. Satan does not wear hearing aid, nor do demons. You don't have to yell. I found that one out too. You don't have to yell. You need to stand in your place prepared for you and stand straight up and realize what you're standing for in your homes. What do you stand for? What are you really serving? Because despite what you have done, you are still joined ears with Christ. And the Father is glorified through the Son as you walk in righteousness. That's why Jesus said, if, she, if you shall ask in my name anything, I will do it. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. The Father is glorified by, in the Son by way of you. If you are a joint heir, you are a joint word or vessel of the word. Jesus was a vessel of the word of God. So are you joint heirs. Jesus said, whatever you have heard me speak, that was the Father. And the Father doeth the works. You are joint heirs with Christ. No one has limited your authority except you. God's authority cannot be utilized for self because it won't be his word, won't be his decrees. Are you guys seeing this? So don't grant your authority over to Satan. Don't be full of the world's ideas that everything you become a vessel of is of the world that his kingdom may grow by your God-given authority. No. House the word of God within yourselves. What's your first step to realize what you actually are? If Christ is the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men, and you're a joint heir with Christ, you are also a vessel that can house the righteousness, the word of the living God, that when you speak it, God can watch over his word, perform it. Nothing is stopping you from doing any of that. You just have to be mindful of who you are and always remind yourself. Do you agree with the word or not? Remind yourself of that. See, this is why we have a lot to do, don't we? We have to get prepared because he is coming back. We don't want, I don't want Christ to come back and we're out of position. We don't even know what we are. No way, Jose. I, I don't want the Lord to come back and we're operating off some sort of theory. No, that we're lovers of self more than God. No, that's when men believe in their own theories too much. When they become lovers of self, when what they have to say becomes the most important thing. That's being a lover of self. No, I want the Father's word because I happen to agree with the ways of the Lord. What about you? Do you guys agree with the ways of the Lord? Not according to your own theories, but according to truth. Jesus demonstrated as he did. So surely you can look at the New Testament and see the demonstration of his word. That is an awesome example of the simplicity of Christ. That Christ demonstrated the gospel. And we can see that demonstration and ask ourselves if we agree with that or not. Because if you do agree with it, then stand in your lot. St stand straight up and be what you're meant to be in this earth. And no darkness will ever overtake you. Now listen, it's a process. But keep in mind your, your, your Lord and Savior is coming back. He's coming back. Let's be mindful of that. See how much we have to prepare for. Because we are to be ready when he comes back. There's no reason for us not to overcome everything in his name right here on this earth. That's our resolve. That's part of our decision. We decide that. Don't speak the world's language and say, I'm too weak. Who told you that? Who said you were too weak? Your father never said you're too weak. 
He said, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. That's a scripture. Not when I'm weak, he is strong. It said, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Do you know why? Because in your weakness, when you can't do anything, that's normally when you call upon him and he demonstrates through you. That's why. So in your weakness, the scripture says, his strength is made perfect. And that's by way of the eye, which means he'll demonstrate. See, once we exhaust our own ways, we essentially are not in the way anymore. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect. He will always do what we're unable to do. 